now we can formally meet. Uh, I, I, won't, I won't ask you to introduce yourselves. I know I could work with some of you for longer in the afternoon, and uh, so I will uh, we'll do that then. But uh, yes, it's all true. Uh, my uh, background is in fact as a biochemist. Um, I, of course, will be speaking in English, but I'll try and speak slowly, uh, just in case there's anybody has any problems with English. Uh, I am sort of a biochemist. I'm Scottish, very important to remember. Uh, I, uh, and uh, I went to university in St Andrews in Scotland, uh, then worked in the Sudan uh, as, a, uh, as an actor on educational television. In those days, so long ago, the Sudanese had an English language channel, educational channel. Just imagine that now. Anyway, but they did. So I worked there, and then I actually came back to the UK, and I worked... Um, for a little while for Oxfam, the overseas charity. And then I went to Oxford, not really because I wanted to do science, actually, because Oxford has two things you can do. You can do a PhD, which I signed up to do, but also you can get into the theatre because the Oxford University Dramatic Society is a well-known way of getting an equity card, the union card. Uh, so I went and I had a go at both. And uh, after a while, although I won prizes and things as an actor, I decided no. I was never going to make a living as an actor. And so I went on I, and studied biochemistry further um, and did a PhD. Had a fairly standard scientific career until the mid-1990s, where I moved from Kent. I was at the University of Kent in, in Canterbury. I moved to the University of the West of England in Bristol and changed over completely to be a science communication specialist, founded a master's degree there, and you heard the rest. So I have a, a, a background in science, not in computing science, incidentally, at all, but I have a background in science um, and in performance. And in the last 15 years, I've been working to bring them together. What I'm going to do today is give you an overview, um, in fact, in a sense, answer the question, well, why communicate science? Why communicate what you do? Uh, and then, having done that, I'm going to get into a bit more detail about some specific aspects of how you might communicate. Um, it would be useful for me to know, as I begin, just who you are in the sense of how many, are you all laboratory or you know, do you all work in research? All of you, okay. And, uh, and are you all, have you all been doing that for some time? How many, how many sort of years? Three years? Five years? Ten years? Okay, so it's a bit of an auction. But you've all, you are all research scientists and you've all worked. And are you all computer scientists? You are all computer scientists? More or less. More or less. On the edges. Okay. Because uh, one of the things, when you're teaching people to communicate, of course, that you're sort of, you have, you're doing two things at once. What I've just done is, very, is a very important thing to do, which is to discover who your audience is. A, a lot of communication is planned without any idea of who the audience is. Uh, and if you try to communicate and not know who the audience is, you, you will almost certainly not communicate with them. So to discover who you're talking to is actually the first thing you do, always. Uh, otherwise, uh, it's impossible, because there's no such thing as a general audience, people are hugely different. What works for an eight-year-old child is not going to work for an 80-year-old man. It's not. So you have to think about that. So, so let's just start with a simple question. Why communicate science to the public? What's the reason? Why is there so much pressure, for example, from the European Union for scientists to communicate? Um, it's becoming a condition of receiving grants from the European Union that you undertake to communicate what you do to non-experts. It has been such a condition in Britain for a long time. Uh, and so there is pressure, significant pressure on scientists to communicate what they do. What are the driving forces for that? Well, basically, there are probably three big reasons why there's pressure on scientists to tell non-scientists what they do. 
One is that across Europe, and indeed now very much in America, there's a tremendous fear that our societies are not creating enough specialists to be the generators of the knowledge which will be the, the currency of this millennium. That actually we don't attract huge numbers of people into science and technology, say at university level. It's beginning to change slightly, but that's more to do with the recession than it is to do with a sudden interest in, instant interest in science and technology. So there's a real issue. Whilst, for example, China is producing about uh, a third of a million engineers a year, uh, America is producing about 60,000. So actually there is an, a, a, a gap arising in terms of the skills base of the different large societies on the planet. And that is not a theoretical problem. It's a practical economic problem. If we can't create things, invent things, we've had it, basically. <laughs> so that's, that's one big reason. And particularly in speaking to computer scientists, you know, I'm not surprised that the gender balance in this room is not exactly um, female dominated <laughs> because uh, there are some subject areas where there are particular issues about gender balance and they tend to be the issues in the physical sciences, things linked to mathematics, computing, physics and so on. I always say to people, if you want to meet lots of girls at university, read psychology. <laughs> if you want to meet lots of boys, read physics. <laughs> uh, so basically, that's, that, that, that is how it has been for a very long time. We could discuss why that is, but maybe that's, a, or you could give me suggestions as to why it might be, but maybe we could do that in the afternoon if you're interested. Um, <clears throat> a big driver of this kind of, you know, why communicate in some parts of, of Europe, and particularly in Britain, has been the issue of the fact that the British public are actually significantly worried about the weather, the risks of carrying out scientific research outweigh the benefits of doing so. And that's not just the British. Uh, if you a survey of 2005, a, a Eurobarometer survey, you know that the European Union makes surveys of opinions across Europe. Well, the, in 2005, they did one about science and technology. In 2005, only 54, 54% of the European population agreed with the statement that the benefits of doing scientific research outweigh the risks. A, a bare majority. Whilst in America, the answer to that question, 85% of people would say that the benefits outweigh the risks, and the same would be true, for example, of Australia. But in Europe, there is a big issue. That's an average, remember. There are countries that are even more sceptical. For example, the Netherlands are the most sceptical. Only 39% of people in Holland believe that the benefits of scientific research outweigh the risks. So we have a genuine issue about the gap between scientists, who I've, I've worked with them for a long, long time, who tend to be of the strong opinion that they're doing things that are going to benefit society, and society which actually, over time, has become more and more sceptical about whether that's the case. And this is not a good gap to have. Uh, it's not a good gap to have for very simple reasons, like uh, right now, all over Europe, there's a big pinch on money. Government money is falling all the time. Pol politicians are meeting and asking themselves, well, what can we cut? What can we not do that people won't worry about? Well, they can't cut health. They can't do much about education, uh, but they can do a lot in an area like scientific research if people don't think it has a value. And so scientific research funding is definitely under threat in Europe, certainly in Britain uh, and over much of Europe, for that reason, that it is politically simple to cut things that people go, well, well, the risks may not outweigh the benefits, and vice versa. Uh, 
But actually, I didn't come and start doing this kind of job for this, any of these reasons, either of those reasons. I came into it because, as a student, I got really, really fed up with going to parties and people would say to me, what, what, did you, what do you do? And I'd say, oh, I'm a biochemist. And they said, I just must go and get another drink. There was a whole side of the fact that because I was a scientist, or technically minded, I had to be the most boring person on the planet. And that did annoy me. Uh, and I felt that, you know, that it was the people who were making that judgment uh, and that science was difficult and science was strange and science was away from society, you know, I, sh I should try and do something about that. Uh, so those are three reasons. I, I, you might well come up with more, but these, I think, are three fairly large reasons. Of course, this business about science moving out of the mainstream of culture happened in the 19th century. It happened when science became big, big and in laboratories and separated from the rest of the world. Before that, it was not the case. Um, so, so, as scientists or engineers, why, what are the benefits of being good communicators? I mean, in now just being specific, not the broad societal, but for you, what are the benefits? Um, well, they come in many forms. Let's have a quick look at First of all, entirely within your own world, more and more scientific research involves teams of people with different scientific expertises. So, as computer scientists, I gather you are, how many of you in this room are working with a scientist or an engineer with a, who is not a computer scientist? Yeah, so even in this room you have a percent of people who are already doing that. Of course, the big world problems, I don't know, say climate change, um, are being looked at by a teams of people with completely different scientific disciplines, all the way from meteorologists to sociologists. You know, so actually, the big scientific questions tend to be more and more about people, scientists with different expertises working together. And they have real communication problems. Uh, you know, I, I, work, I work sometimes training the chairs of cost actions, who are European sort of high up people. They chair sort of networks that bring together researchers working in roughly the same area across Europe. And there's one really interesting one, which was about computer science and the use of uh, data storage processes in um, information retrieval for the humanities. You know, for now an awful lot of data is now store, is now being transferred to an end to electronic forms. You know, old Bibles, ancient literature, all the sorts of things which people who study in the humanities are suddenly being electron, ele electronically stored. But someone's got to decide which ones, because you may not be able to store them all. And you could have exactly what's happened before when you have had jumps in technology, where things fall between the cracks, things don't get copied, things aren't in the archive, people forget to scan them. People, and so there's got to be collaboration between specialists in the humanities and computer scientists. And this is actually proving extremely <laughs> difficult because they don't speak the same language. And so actually that whole area, which is very crucial, we could lose a lot of the cultural background of humankind, if we're not careful, um, is not, it's not easy to do because of the very different views of the disciplines involved. Just, just for an example. Um, of course, there are nice simple reasons. <laughs> like, like, like being good to communicate is absolutely crucial to find funding for what you do. Essentially, to get funding, you need to persuade someone that it's worth funding you. And that is a communication task, more than anything else. Because what you write, what you do, is going to be set alongside many excellent proposals in scientific terms. So why are they going to fund yours? Well, often it's because they understand what you're up to, because they can somehow grasp the value of what you're doing. 
Um, and a failure to do that can often be the difference between, well, it's a nice proposal, but, you know, to, well, we'll do that, because I can imagine that having been efficacious in society or that being useful or, that's fascinating. Why don't we, you know? So there are lots of things about good quality communication which are about finding money. Actually, I've been quite good at finding money through my career, mainly, I think, because of communication skill, and not so very much because I'm doing absolutely extraordinary things. Um, so there is, a, there is a large amount of that in this. Um, of course, for, for people working at the interfaces between technology, science, and society, there's the whole issue about, well, it's great to have come up with something amazing in a laboratory, but persuading, particularly in the context of a science park like this, then working with the people who will take that innovation into the marketplace and to people is a different issue altogether. They speak a different language. In, in, they're interested in money, for example. Lots of it, for example. They, there are lots of reasons why. That's a completely different communication challenge. But it's very difficult to persuade people to put capital into research, hard-nosed entrepreneurs, unless you're very good at explaining how that's going to work, how your innovation is going to make a difference and sell, make zillions of euros. Um, of course, here's a broader one about the opportunities for the public to discuss the impact of discovery on them. Uh, I mean, there are, there's so much going on in terms of innovation uh, that sometimes the public can be taken by surprise by new innovations. And in Britain, genetic modification of organisms was a very classic example of this. No one, I, w I remember when they first created genetically modified organisms and they couldn't get the press interested in it in Britain. They had to make up sort of strange stories like, well, it could be that you could make square tomatoes and they would fit better into sandwiches <laughs> than round tomatoes. Or we've created a rose which when you breathe on it, glows in the dark. The ultimate gift for your lover. <laughs> two, two true stories, two true applications, early applications of genetic modification. And then, you know, suddenly you have the Monsanto, you know, Roundup Ready Soya. The whole subject explodes and people basically go, you never told us about any of this. What the hell are you doing? You're mucking around with a bit of the, well, I don't want to, well, I mean, bang. Just went berserk. And huge amounts of investment in GM technologies, which had been made particularly for the food industry, were lost, basically. They just disappeared. Uh, I worked at that time sometimes for Unilever as a sort of creativity consultant. They lost three billion pounds because they couldn't make use of the technologies they created relating to genetically modified organisms and food. So actually ha not having that connection between society and then taking them by surprise, as in, you know, we've got something you'll really like, ah, is not not good in, in many, many ways. It destroys trust in science and scientists, so you have fewer people come forward to be scientists, and also it, it can have massive economic implications. So, so who are the audiences that one would, could talk to in terms of communicating your science? Well, they're quite varied. Uh, obviously, I've said already, colleagues in the broad sense of p other scientists, not necessarily, or not necessarily scientists, people from other disciplines. You may well want to have them as an audience. Uh, policy makers, obviously, you, in many cases, scientists are extremely keen to bring what they do to the attention of policy makers and persuade them this is something they should invest in in the future. Public funders, we've already talked about a little bit. Also, venture capitalists and businessmen. And then this last group, which is basically the broad public. Uh, and this is where problems often begin because people see it as a single audience. And as I said to you as I began, 
that it's not a single audience. It's a very diverse audience. And something that works for, uh, for one group will not work for another. And so the, the magic bullet of science communication doesn't exist. You have to target your message at a particular audience in a particular way for it to work. So, what are the options? So, what can you do? Well, there are lots of things you could do, but they fall into three categories in my mind. There's direct interaction with the public. You know, you can get out there into Klagenfurt Town Square with a, with a, with a, with a demonstration of what something that you do, uh, and you can have people gather around you, and you can talk to them and explain what you're up to and why you do it and how it works and get them to play around a bit and whatever it is that you have them doing. And that's become something which more and more happens more and more, uh, you know, in shopping malls and so on. Uh, universities tend to sponsor that kind of thing. Uh, there's also, of course, media coverage. Uh, and uh, so I'm, I'll be doing a little bit of work on media coverage and being interviewed and things like that in the afternoon. Uh, just so you can get maybe a bit better thinking about how do you prepare yourself to be involved with the media. Because uh, I'm, scientists tend to have very poor opinions of the media in terms of the reporting of science. But the bad news for you all is it's at least partly scientists' fault. Because they enter into the conversation with the media without any preparation. So they just blunder in without thinking, well, what do I want to say? Simple things like that. And consequently, they get misreported. And they go, oh, the media, Dah, well, they're awful, terrible people, constantly distorting. No, often it's not that, not only that. Often it is the scientists are just bad at saying what they do. And they get misunderstood, like you would at a coffee party or whatever. It's not necessarily just the naughty old media making a story out of nothing. It happens, of course. I'm not saying it doesn't happen. I'm just saying that's not it all. It's not an excuse for being as good at preparing to be interviewed by the media as you would be for preparing a talk for a conference. It's not an excuse. And of course, there's the electronic world now, which is very interesting. You know, blogs, YouTube, Twitter, they go on and on and on and on. I mean, there are a whole series of ways in which individuals can now have their opinion, can now reach large numbers of other people um, and, obviously, this can be used in science communication. Uh, there's some quite interesting blogs, for example, which are just scientists blogging about what they do every day. Just about, because one of the issues for the public about scientists is they have no idea what you do. I mean, they know you're in a building, glass walls and things, and they, they sort of think about laboratories. Most cases, they'll have you with chemical equipment. The, the public tend to see scientists as chemists just because it's easier to portray uh, test tubes and, and bubbling liquids and colour. And chemists tend to be what the public see scientists as being, interestingly. Not biologists, not computer scientists, not physicists, chemists, particularly children. If you ask them to draw a scientist, they will draw a chemist, almost always. So basically, that's who they think you are. I know you're not, but that's who they think you are. Uh, and uh, so basically, blogging about what a scientist does every day, which obviously you think, well, God, bloody hell, I know what I do every day. But actually, from the public point of view, is quite, quite an innovation, because they just haven't had a clue what people do. Um, so I'm going to go through these four, three now and just sort of pick them apart a bit for you, give you a bit of insight, look behind the scenes, and hopefully challenge a few of your thoughts about it. So. Direct interaction, what are, the, what are the good things about it? Well, the major thing that's good about it is that the public meet a scientist. Now, I so, don't know about Austria exactly, but it would be, be unusual if it was very different across Europe. If you go out there into Klagenfurt and ask people, have you ever met a scientist? They will tell you no. They will say they've never met a scientist. In, in Britain, only 15% of the population think they've met a scientist. Uh, it probably let, might be slightly more here or slightly less, but it will be around in that region. The great majority of people don't think they ever met one of you at all, right? Now, you say, well, oh, well, well, so what? Well, the problem with that is a great deal about public perception. 
Um, who do you think, if you do a survey around Europe, who do you th talking about professionals now, who do you think are the most trusted professionals? Doctors, correct. Uh, any others? Pilots, Pilots that's a good one. I'm not pilot. Well, yeah, pilots. I have to say that. I, I certainly trust them, have to. Uh, although I know they're really a computer in disguise. Uh, uh, <laughs> yes, pilots. Actually, nurses. Nurses, highly trusted. But there's another interesting group who are not professionals, but are also tend, in most places, to be highly trusted. They're the people who visit your house maybe every day. Who visits your house every day? A postman? In the old days, a milkman in Britain. They, they don't deliver milk so much now. Did they de deliver milk in Austria? Nah, they never did. <laughs> nah. Fair enough. Anyway, but you'll be interested to know that postmen are generally highly trusted in society. Not, not, not for their beauty or their brains, but because they are there. They're there every day. You meet them. And for example, therefore, when postmen go on strike, the level of public sympathy for them is much greater than for, for other, other professions. Like, for example, rubbish collectors. Because you don't meet them. So people you, there is a rough correlation between people you encounter and people you trust. And so, not people saying they haven't met a scientist is not good news, because the level of trust, or even of interest in what you do, will be much lower if they don't think they've met you. And your professional body, for example, will not be seen as so important as, say, the professional body that, look, that um, represents doctors in Austria. When that professional body says, we should do this, or that's wrong, everybody goes, but they, they've just said it's wrong. Whilst, you know, if, if your professional body says um, something, people go, oh, yeah, well, hmm. It depends. It goes all the way up. But trust is about meeting people. And all, what I was saying earlier about these extraordinary stereotypes of scientists which people hold in their heads from childhood, wonderful study being done, got people to draw, eight-year-old children to draw scientists all across Europe, so, you know, all the way from Slovenia to Portugal. And uh, they draw the same person, roughly, Male. I see they look a lot like me. Kind of wild, hairy, and unreliable. <laughs> <laughs> they look like sort of Einstein on speed. And basically, that's how they look. That's how they and that perception, I mean, people don't ask adults to draw scientists, it's a bit embarrassing. <laughs> but actually, that perception of who a scientist is is embedded in children by the age of eight across Europe. And as I say, so Women don't feature in this stereotype at all. Uh, anybody who looks vaguely normal doesn't. <laughs> uh, and interestingly, you know, things like Einstein, you'd think, well, that would be a good stereotype. Many universities, for example, will put Einstein on publicity literature and things. You know, a good association. Actually, well, not necessarily so, because Although unbelievably clever, he, he was photographed once with his tongue out. <laughs> and, and that perception of someone who's a bit strange, a bit, oh, you know, you know that picture, you know that? Yeah. Yeah, in a single blow, probably did more to degrade the view of science, of who scientists are in terms of their seriousness, their attachment to society, than, than he ever did with all, his, all, the wonderful, all the wonderful quotes and whatever. That one picture, which is everywhere, is a real problem. Uh, because it's not a normal, it's not a picture of someone who appears to be in their right mind. That's a problem. Um, another thing which scientists quite like about direct interaction is that they get to control the content that they're giving the story. They're not using a, a, a middle person like a journalist, they're telling their story. Well, that's, there's, there is some truth in that, and particularly in small groups, certainly, the chance to chat to people about what you do, just one or two people, is, is very powerful and a big impact experience for all those people who don't think they've ever met one like person like you. But actually, in this kind of setting, 
a talk, you're all today in a completely different talk, okay? Because you're paying attention to me sometimes and not paying attention to me some other times. When I say things which happen to, la to link to the ways you think or to your own interests, you listen intently, and now and again, you wander off and think, have I parked the car in the right place? Or, you know, what have I got to buy, you know, what have I got to buy from the shops as I go home? You know, or did I leave my computer on? You know, everybody in this room is coming in and out of listening to me. And so when you compare notes, and you'll have done this many times when you've been to seminars and things, you've no doubt been surprised that the people around you seem to be in a different seminar altogether. They've heard things that you haven't heard, and you've heard things they haven't heard, and sometimes you completely misunderstood each other. And yet you've been sitting, as you are, in front of someone who thinks they're talking clearly to you. And it's not necessarily that they are garbling what they're saying, it's just you're not listening to them at the same moments in the audience. You, you come in and out of listening, you have to. It's how we relax. So actually, you never sit like a tape recorder you always are. Something will occur to you, something I say, you know, an Einstein reference will take you, specifically, one of you, off to somewhere else the day that you saw an Einstein lookalike standing in, you know, whatever. You, it will take you somewhere else and for a moment you won't be listening to me. You'll be in that place, remembering seeing the Einstein lookalike. So, talking is deceptive. It appears you're saying the same thing to everybody, Actually, they're listening differently to you. That's the crucial thing, which why lecturing is such a waste of time. But no, he said whilst lecturing. Uh, finally, if you are going to interact directly, then you can have two-way communication. Then I can talk to you. I can ask you who you think are the most trusted. I can make eye contact with you all. I can see if one of you looks really puzzled, then I can sort of go, um, oh, um, is that all right? You know, I, think. I can be attuned to you to a certain extent, whilst with, with um, talking to you through the media. Obviously, I can't. So there, there is actually a possibility for two-way communication. That doesn't have to be I ask you questions. It can just be eye contact. And once again, sort of re so I'm talking about communication, but I also obviously I'm communicating. One thing I'm trying to do is always share the gaze of all of you from time to time. You're smiling, which is good, so I look at you a lot. But I must be aware not to look at you too much. Because if I give you a lecture, they'll all go to sleep. So, so I'm looking at you all. I hope you notice that I'm actually catching or trying to catch the gaze of you all from time to time. I'm, my eyes are following around the room. So that you at least have a sort of a feeling that I'm talking to you rather than just to a group of people. And that you can do with direct communication and you can't do with indirect communication. So, but what are the minuses? Well, going to the people through the media, obviously there's a big audience. And if, you, if you arrange an, of an event where you're going to do something with the public, the audiences will usually be small. Unless you're going to do something extraordinary like launch a rocket or something, but generally, it'll be small. Also, I, I, many people, particularly young scientists, get quite interested in communicating and they create some kind of experience for the public about their work, but they find it very difficult to do it more than once. They work towards doing it for an open day event or something, and they do it once, and they, take, and they all say, that was wonderful, let's do more of that, and then often they don't. <laughs> because they haven't the time, it's not sustained. Um, but a big thing is that there's a huge danger with this kind of work of, of only having audiences who, in your case, for example, know an enormous amount about computer science already. They're not the imagined ignorant public who are being drawn into just talking for the first time about computer science or discovering new things about it. They're actually often computer science nerds from out there who are, turn up essentially to show how much they know about it. So, basically, it's not, if, and you increase that danger if you hold your event in a, a research institute or in a university. Because you must remember that most people don't 
don't feel that comfortable in those spaces. It's always very hard to say to people who've come through the educational process you know, and to an enormous length and to great levels of specialisation and say to them, you know, you're a bit different from most people because they go, we're not. Not at all. Well, you are. You've been in education a long time. You're very comfortable with the sort, these sorts of rather odd surroundings. Uh, you like being talked at, for example, which is rare. To a certain extent, I mean, it would be possible to make it you didn't want to be talked at, but for the general, generally you're really used to being talked at. But you have to remember the public are not. Not at all used to being talked at. They don't like being talked at, and they don't want to go to spaces where they feel that they're second, second rate. So non-graduates will, as a rule, not go onto a university campus. They might, but it's very difficult to get them there. Into a research institute, probably even harder. But basically, when you hold events, it was mentioned by established science festivals around the world. Well, who comes to them? Well, if you do the survey, 85% of the people who come to a science festival are graduates. They're already well educated and they're bringing their children for an experience which they see as being a further boost to their education. You are not getting the bricklayers and the roof menders and the road menders and the rubbish collectors queuing to come to events in universities. So if you're going to do that, you're going to have to look at other venues, other ways of reaching them, places they do go to. So there is a real danger in direct interaction, particularly if you do it in an uncritical way of basically just, just talking to people who already know loads about what you're doing. In some cases, probably about as much as you do. Well, media coverage, I've covered some of this in the reverse, but basically you get a big audience, potentially. Um, it can really set agendas. You know, if you get a big story on the front page of, of a newspaper, then you know, politicians see it, policymakers see it. Actually, it can become the thing they talk about you know, over coffee. Um, it can really penetrate, particularly some newspapers, because you know, every country has some newspapers that are read seriously by policymakers and politicians and some that aren't. But basically, it can be a pretty effective way of getting your view, if you can get a front page story, that is, but it, it can be a very effective view, way of getting your view to them. Um, also, of course, you can select an audience. I don't know how many of you know the British press, but the Sun is the tabloid with the naked lady on page three, and the Guardian is the super serious liberal sort of left of centre paper, which, which I like, which is about to go bust, I think. My daughter works for them, I think she's about to lose her job. Anyway, one way or another, the, the, the difference. Of course you choose. When, you, when someone phones you from the sun and says, can I speak to you about your work? You say, well, no. <laughs> uh, but people, scientists don't say no, they say yes. And then they get very annoyed when they have a sun-type sto sun story about their work, as if it came as a surprise. They expected the sun to become the guardian overnight. Um, or to, if that nice man from the sun, the guardian, phones up, you say, Can I have, I'm very interested in your work. I wonder if we could talk about it. You know what you're going to get in terms of what kind of article you're going to get. It may not be 100% correct, but it's going to be a very different style. Um, what about the minuses of media coverage? Well, the lack of control. As I say, scientists, if I had a pound for every time, scientists say, I never said that my research could transform computing. Never did. And you say, well, what did you say? I say, well, I, I, said it was, I said it was a very significant new innovation. Uh, you know, something, you know, really interesting and intriguing. You know, might, might, might. I use the word might, they say. I use the might, <laughs> might, might. And so, of course, all this is filtered out by the reporting process, you know, whether you said might or may or must or ought or... Uh, basically, back to my point, if you're going to interact with the media, which I suggest you do, but you have to know what you're doing, you have to be professional about it, not amateur. And too many scientists basically do make, actually, claims, because you play them the tape back, click, you, go, you know, you did say that this might transform computing, you did. Say, I never did. Yes, you did. At the very end, you said, do you think your work is of any significance, you know, in the bigger picture? And you said, yes. Yes, I think it might transform this or that aspect of computing. And they go, oh, did I? So it's not always that you've got uh, the lack of control is entirely on the press's side. I'm not entirely defending them. It would be stupid to do so. 
they can be very responsible, but it's not something which scientists can just wash their hands of. Um, the other thing is, of course, that there's a very limited focus of press reporting. If you go back to what I've just been saying about the importance of knowing scientists, well, when, when the press report a breakthrough, a scientific breakthrough, have you, have, have you ever been reported in the press? No, you've never been reported. Okay. Well, what would happen when you are, I'm sure you all will be, is it, the, it, it, the, it sounds like this. Um, an, an eminent computer scientist, Professor Schmidt, today, and actually in, Br in Britain, in brackets after the Professor Schmidt, they would be 48. Today reported that a, a new kind of, I don't know, nanotechnological approach can minimize the, you know, whatever it is. And, and so what do you learn about the scientist? Well, you learn their scientific rank, you learn that they're eminent, but then the public take for granted anybody who gets in the press eminent, and then you earn their age. I mean, it might be more interesting if it said, Professor Schmidt, eight, that'd be quite amusing. Or Professor Schmidt, 108, that'd be interesting too, but 48? So basically, you don't learn anything about the scientists from most reporting of science in the press, which is a problem. Um, and of course, the last thing is that it's a one-way communication medium. You know, more, it's beginning to change. You know, linkage of newspapers to quite elaborate websites mean that now you can have discussion online triggered by something in a newspaper. But it's still pretty creaky and difficult, and, and you have to go from one to the other and so on. But it sort of happens. But all the same, television, for example, is still a one-way medium. I mean, you can shout at your television, but it doesn't shout back. So there's a real difference between these two. Then there's the electronic world, which I, I kind of guess you know a lot more about than I do, so I'll, I'll try not to speak too quickly at this point. <laughs> but it's simple, and it has very low cost. I mean, I have set up blogs, and I can do it for nothing. Just get onto WordPress, and it's done. Um, and there are new audiences out there that are, haven't been reached by other means, particularly young adults who make extensive use of the electronic world and of social networks and so on, who um, potentially, they are missing from the attendance profile of university open days or of science museums, or they're, they're missing. They're not communicated with generally by the ways that we use now, and they're, they're there online. So there has to be potential. It hasn't been tapped yet at all but there has to be potential for that in terms of communicating science. And of course, it's potentially viral. You know, if you get a particularly funny video and put it on YouTube, millions of people may watch it or do watch it. So you've got the possibility of a very big audience if you know the medium well and use it intelligently. What about the minuses? Well, it is hard to be noticed. Uh, you know, so many projects that I look at, communication projects or scientific projects that have websites, are terribly disappointed because no nobody visits their website. You say, well, why do you think they would visit it? And you say, well, because they'd be browsing. So, but it, no, no, they won't be browsing and just go, oh, that looks fascinating, necessarily. And so there are lots of problems with being noticed on the web. Um, and the other is, there's a lot of rubbish on the web. And public might not necessarily discriminate too well between the rubbish and the non-rubbish. So the default position is, it's all rubbish. Which means that you've got a battle to establish your credentials online. If you're going to be online, you have to have some way of signalling that you are trustworthy and that you are not uh, some crank group that believes the moon is about to collide with the earth or whatever. Um, now, <clears throat> this is probably an important slide. Up till now, I've been painting you a picture, I hope, of the world of science communication. This now is my first sort of concrete piece of, so, what, how do you do it? What is it that are the key things? This is the key question 
in terms of communication as far as I'm concerned. What about what I do, my research, will be relevant to a non-scientist? Um, and it's, it's something which a lot of scientists struggle with, is, well, but, but it's so, what I do is so intricate and complicated and, uh, and, and technical that how possibly could the public interact with it? How could I get them interested in it? How does it relate to their world, to their lives? And uh, I had that experience in, in Finland this year. I was, I was one of these workshops of senior scientists, and there was a guy who was a computer scientist who was working on um, analytical, no, I'm going to get this wrong, analytical software which was able to uh, do about computer crashes, about computer bugs. And rather than having so much crashing happen post the software being released, this was a new way of constructing software, a new way of analysing, quality controlling software, which, mi which minimised the bugs and the crashing. And he said to me, well, whenever there's an open university open day, they're never interested in my work. They all want to go to the space science department. And I said, well, talk to me about it. He said, well, computer com software crashing is estimated to cost three billion euro a day worldwide. Because there are some, lots of circumstances where software crashes, it has pretty significant consequences, like the traffic lights in a city stop working or something. So actually, I think that's probably a concern. So very, very large amounts of money are involved, caused, but are lost because computers crash. And I said, so you're working on saving the world lots and lots of money and trouble. He said, yeah. yeah. And uh, so have your story to tell then about your work and its relevance to people, because everybody has their computer crash. I mean, pretty well all the time, in my case. But anyway, but basically, it's something everybody experiences. It's a shared experience of humankind, or at least in the developed world, that computers crash. You're working on something which could reduce the extent to which that happens. It's a great story. And there's billions of pounds involved. It's a great story. We said, oh, you know, I never thought of it that way, really. And so that connection between, it was not to do with the technicalities of what he did. Bloody hell, he didn't try to explain to me you know, how, how, the soft, how his software worked to screen and detect potential glitches in other people's software. He didn't, and he never could explain that to the public. But he could explain really quite well why he was doing what he did and why it had value in the public domain. And it's very rare to come across research which doesn't have that ingredient of a, some, it's being created, after all, it's usually being funded because at some background level it's seen as having a societal benefit, as benefiting society at some point in the future. That's usually why the money's there. So usually, it's very rare, I suppose you might say that theoretical physicists may sometimes be working on things which are just so wide open that they can't explain precisely how the implications in, in the terms of society. But it's rare. Um, so this is the first question. And it's not an easy one for a scientist to answer on their own because they're very close to what they do. And consequently, a good way of looking at this is often to talk about what you do to someone who is not an expert at all. So I meet a lot of scientists who say, well, well, my parents or my grandparents keep asking me what I do. And I keep not knowing what to say to them. You know, I, I, I just don't, they don't know what I do. And every time I, I, they ask me, they seem to get more confused. And it's those, it's those kinds of conversations, if extended to just explore how they see the work you do, which gives the clues to the answering this question. It doesn't have to be your relatives, it could be someone, you know, it could be a friend who's not a scientist, it could be any number of people, but they tend to be the people who, over time, get you to realise, because they'll say things like, oh, I see, so that means that 
you go, no, no, it doesn't mean that. But it does mean, and so on. So you're beginning to think in this way. It's very important to do that because you have to build some kind of bridge between what you're doing and the real world and, the, and the, the world in which everybody else is living in and experiencing. So the other thing which is crucial is who am I talking to? Um, and this question is one which is often not properly addressed. You know, when people say, devise an open event for a university or a research lab. They have this broad idea that, you know, people will turn up. They're not quite sure who they'll be, and that's fair enough, they can't be sure. But um, to some extent, they need to be thinking, well, there'll be some children. So there has to be something within what we do that day which is accessible to children. They're likely to be some older people because uh, they have, often have time. You know, when you have events like, if you, particularly if you hold them during the week, a lot of people who turn up will be older people who no longer have a full-time job. So what, what is it that will be of interest to them? Uh, what aspects of what I do of interest to them? And then there'll be you know, families, professional people, and so on. But each of those groupings has to be considered on, as an audience. And it's not the case that what fascinates an eight-year-old child is going to work for a businessman. Uh, so who are you talking to? And that may involve some research. You may need, if you're actually getting involved seriously in a communication project of your own, then you may have to go out and talk to representatives of the audience you want to talk to. You know, if it's 16 to 18 year old girls about becoming computer scientists, you may have to actually go and find a group of 16 to 18 year old girls and talk to them about, well, how do you see computer science? What, what aspects of it interest you? What aspects of it puzzle you? Do you see its connection to the real world? Back in the question here. You have, may have to have that conversation with some real people who can say, well, well, I, the problem is I don't quite see how it makes a difference in society, you say, or whatever they're going to say. And then you understand their position better, and then you can create something which will be more effective as a communication tool. So, so what is it you want to say to them? <laughs> now, this business about key messages is very important. Scientists tend, you know, I, I, I spend a lot of time working with nanotechnologists. And, and so they say, um, I say, what do you want to do? So I say, we want to tell people about nanotechnology. Good. What part of nanotechnology? Well, oh, oh nanotechnology. You say, well, yeah, but are there any particular aspects of nanotechnology you want to talk about? No, no, no. We just want them to understand what nanotechnology is. And you say, well, actually, that would be a really difficult thing to do. You have to say, to you have to decide, for example, are you going to construct something whose message is nanotechnology is about very, 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 very small things? Is that what you're going to do? Well, okay. So you construct everything with that message, that it's about very small things. Or are you going to construct something which says nanotechnology will be, at the cent will be central to the development of new medicines over the next 25 years? If you want that, then that's got to be where everything is focusing. But you can't have one of these exhibitions where one stall's about it being very small, one thing's about medicine, one thing's about paint, one thing's about... It's an utterly confusing experience for the audience. Actually, you want to keep it clear. What is your message? And these messages, which we'll work on a little bit on this, this afternoon, are things that you'd walk into a room and say to someone. You would say, do you know, nanotechnology is about really tiny things. And then, okay, you then build all the experiences that your audience are going to have with that message. Just that. Not it's about saving lives, not it's about creating self-cleaning windows, but it's about very, very small things. Everything will have that focus. So the person will leave the exhibition saying, ah, do you know, nanotechnology is about very, very small things. They will have got it. People won't get multiple messages. They might get layers of message, but they're not going to get utterly different ones. 
So you've got to think carefully about what your message is and keep it simple and be strict with yourselves and actually make it something you would say to someone. Not, this is going to be about nanotechnology, but so what are you going to say to someone about nanotechnology? What are you going to say to someone about computer science? Not, not everything that you possibly could say about computer science and its role in the world, but what particularly do you want to say? That's the key to people really getting something out of what you're doing. And then, having gone through those first crucial steps, then you think up, well, what sort of experience could I give someone in my target audience which would get this message to them? What, would it, what can I do that would get this message to them? And you have to then think of, would it be an experience, would it be a game? You know, if my target audience is, is children, would it be a game? If my target audience is, is young adults, um, would it be some, some, an opportunity, for example, to remotely manipulate a scanning electron microscope? You know, what would, it, what would it be that I would do for the particular audiences, particular places? Um, and finally, and very importantly, well, how would you know it works? You know, I mean, okay, so you've done it, and you've, your friends are pleased, and you're pleased, and you've, you've survived, but how do you know that actually there was any impact? And you have to evaluate, which is something which, of course, as scientists, you do all the time, and you would have to do it here too. You have to ask yourselves, okay, so how do we know that the message that we were trying to get across, the specific message, got across? Not, did you enjoy the event, not all, but... What, what did you get from this in terms of the message? That is a very critical piece of evaluation, obviously. I mean, people may or may not enjoy stuff. And if, most people actually will say they enjoy things if you ask them immediately afterwards. <laughs> uh, but essentially, there are, there are more detailed forms of evaluation that can really help you. So, coming towards the last little bit I'm going to say, you always say that, by the way. Why do you say that? Well. There's a curve of listening, back to listening. Somewhere around 20 minutes after I started talking, I began to lose you. At about sort of 10% of attention per 10 minutes. <laughs> so by now, you're not really paying a lot of attention at all. But when I say I'm just about to wrap up, you'll suddenly all go, bing, again. Thank God he's going to stop talking. So, so you can cheat. <laughs> by saying, oh, and I'm just coming towards the end of what I'm going to say. People then go, Poh, bloody hell, I can come awake again. And they, they pay attention from that point to the end. And you can string it out a bit. <laughs> so they keep thinking you're going to end, you don't quite. That's fine. But you recapture them in that moment. But you've lost them. I can tell by looking at your eyes. You, you've lost them. I lost you about, most of you, about 10 minutes ago. So basically, that's a way of recapturing your attention. Um, so I just say, well, just I'm coming towards the end of what I'm going to say now, and there'll be plenty of time for questions and things. So, and then, I'm now, now I'm back to being frank again, okay? <laughs> You've seen between the lines. So basically, uh, what could you do? Well, what type of event or experience could you have? Well, you could have talks. You could have posters. You could have events in public spaces. Performances, maybe. Science festivals. These are just examples. Um, Actually, I've already critiqued some of these already. Talks. The issue with talks is that within the scientific community, that's what you do. You go to conferences and you listen to talks and you give talks. Uh, and as I said to you, actually, this is a very abnormal behaviour. It works between scientists perfectly well because within the scientific community, that's what a scientific conference is. Loads of talks. Um, but if you try to transfer that to talking to the public, they're going to be pretty puzzled. <laughs> so basically, there is a way, you know, when people have an open day at a lab, you know, they go around and say, well, you could talk about, um, and you could give a talk about that, and yeah, you could talk about your, you know, and so on. So you end up with a sort of three or four talks, and that's it, you know, that's, that's the way to present. Actually, for the public, that probably does not going to work, simply because they're just not in that culture. They're not used to being talked at. They don't get it. The culture of science 
is about talks, but not the general culture. So um, it's something scientists do. It's not very suitable. Actually, they may have not, it may not be a neutral experience. Many of them may have very negative experiences of being talked at, at school, for example. They may have had science teachers who just talked and they wrote notes. You may have had that kind of science teacher yourself. But basically, that, they may have had very negative experiences of being talked at. Um, but they are not useless at all. If you get the language level right, and if you get the level of complexity right for the audience, they can be very useful. It's not that they're hopeless, but you have to think really carefully, and they're not the default. They're not the thing that you always do. There's something that might now and again be useful. If you have, for example, a little demonstration to give or something, something to keep people's attention. But generally, not very easy for the public to understand the, the talk culture. Posters are even more difficult because, once again, within the culture of science, there is the dreaded scientific poster, which is probably the worst communication tool in the history of the universe because for well, two reasons. First of all, it's not actually designed to be seen alone. There's always that nervous person standing beside it, waiting to answer questions. So there's a sort of cop-out for the poster designer that there will be someone there to explain it. Which, of course, with a poster generally, wouldn't, you know, in a public space, you don't have someone standing by the advertising going, by the way, this is selling orange juice. And, uh, no. So basically, there's a, there's a sense in which a poster is not even meant, a scientific poster isn't even meant to stand alone. It's meant to be explained. And thank heavens it is. Because usually, it's unbelievably difficult to read. Um, it's got very small lettering, often font size 12 at knee height. Uh, <laughs> it's pretty often all very hard to know which way to read it, even to know which way to read it, to go from there to there to there, from there to here to here, from there to here to there to there to... Yeah. It's a completely puzzling experience. So the scientific poster, and what's really interesting is when people hold open days and things, they put up scientific posters in the corridors. That's what they do. And people go, blimey. Uh, <laughs> Because they're, well, first of all, because they're not designed to be seen alone. If you're going to put one up, you should be standing beside it, because that's what it was designed for. And second, if you put it up, uh, they've never you've seen one like, to anything like that in their lives before. It's unbelievably complicated for something you're meant to read. So basically, when scientists create posters for people other than scientists, they have to go back to first principles. Forget the scientific poster. It's, not, it's a perfectly viable communication tool between scientists, but absolutely appalling in any other setting. So you have to think, how are you going to, what is it? What visual cues? And people like high quality visuals. They, they love cartoons, they love diagrams, they, love, they don't like words, they don't want loads of text. But they love to have things illustrated in intriguing, fun ways. So it's possible to create a poster that works, but you've got to be very, very careful. And you have to step away from the academic style. Um, you have to use a style which is common to the audience, not to you. Um, I'll illustrate that in a moment. Um, and graphics are very audience selective. I'll also hopefully demonstrate that to you in a moment. So here's a poster which was designed, the posters, designed um, for buses, for the insides of buses um, a few years ago, aimed at 16 to 25 year olds in Britain. There, there are a lot of these people of that age on buses in Britain, inside buses. Uh, when people get to that sort of mid-twenties, they buy a car. But before then, they often are on buses. Uh, this is one about chemistry. I'm afraid it doesn't come out fantastically well in this slide. But basically, Chemical Brothers, which you're of the generation who... Actually, you may be too young now to know what the chemical... I don't know how quickly people... The Chemical Brothers are a sort of techno dance thing. I used to call it a pop group, and all my research group would go, it's not a pop group, Frank. <laughs> 
whatever it is, it attracts the attention of that, that phrase, will attract the attention of the audience. It's a very simple poster. This says a little chemistry makes a big difference. And basically, it's sand is, is, is silica and glass is silica. It's things that are physically very different but chemically very similar. And it, and it was made for the Royal Society of Chemistry in Britain uh, in the uh, year 2000, I think. But basically, we evaluated this, 750 face-to-face -face interviews on buses with people. What do you make of this, then? <laughs> and the answer was, well, they didn't get this bit at all, the chemical brothers' relationships between different... <laughs> what they did like was they liked the graphic. Because this graphic... This kind of graphic is used a lot in, for example, um, advertising on little postcards for gigs, events, for um, clubs, for festivals, for people aim of roughly this age. So this kind of graphic rings a bell, but the too many words. That's too many words. Now think of a scientific poster. <laughs> <laughs> That's too many words. This is nearer. We this, this was evaluated and is nearer to correct the top ones. The top one works, the bottom one doesn't. I wonder why you, if you can tell me why the bottom one doesn't work. She's holding a phone. So what would you come to the conclusion if you saw that on, inside a bus? That you were selling a mobile phone. So you couldn't have a consumer product in a poster like that in a bus, because people will think you're trying to sell them something. So, but this one worked rather well. Um, you notice this is our third attempt, okay? But you'll notice it's about physics. Well, you would, because physics, 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 physics. So, any way you look on this poster, physics. The actual message is thanks to physics. The, this is a speeding racing car. Some people Pens, actually. People on buses don't necessarily bring their glasses. So there's one lady who thought it was a cabbage. But anyway, we thought, <laughs> we thought, we think it's a speedy racing car. But you'll notice we now have got, got it roughly right in terms of a poster in a public place. It contains between 9 and 12 words. That's the maximum usually used. Um, the words are repeated. And the graphic is still striking. The graphic still has that feel, that sort of techno uh, light feel, which is used in advertising directed at this age group at that time. I think probably still is used a lot, but this is now a decade old. So those are posters. And the graphics are the thing that really work in terms of attracting the attention of the audience. So here's a poster we created later. Um, based on that experience, and I'm just, just going to explain it to you and then I'll ask you a question about it. So, uh, it's a science poster. Um, Neighbours is a soap opera, an Australian soap opera, much watched by people in Britain, and we've illustrated it using our planetary Neighbours. Destiny's Child's a pop group. We've just, it's an embryo. Hearsay, there's another pop group at that time, and we've used it to illustrate the part of the brain which is involved in speech and the part of the brain that's involved in saying, saying and hearing. Unfortunately, Hearsay broke up as a pop group just after we made the poster. <laughs> but, well, you kind of everything. Um, and uh, The Matrix, which you know as being a film, uh, and a Honeycomb is a Matrix. So, Basically, and this bit in the middle is to put a, to advertise events and things in. So it was left blank so people could fill it in, put whatever they wanted inside it. So what sort of age group do you think that was aimed at? What? Teenagers. Yes, teenagers. Young or old teenagers? Young. 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 It's, it's actually younger, 12 to 14. What gender of teenager? Female. Female. Yeah. So, I'll just illustrate you. You can decode posters extremely well. Uh, so, if we... Cr and and you don't, I'm sure you don't like that. <laughs> and you go... <laughs> but 
because it, it's just not to your taste. It's not people of your age and actually your gender, mainly your gender, w w would not... <laughs> would not find that particularly appealing as a poster. So, but, using what we knew, we could produce, this was a highly successful poster with that target audience. Using these colors, using these very few words, using this illustration, it was a very popular poster, it was reprinted a number of times. Incidentally, it actually really is this shape, because this is for the corridor of a school. It was to advertise events like, I don't know, lecture about the brain in the school hall this evening kind of thing. And it's for the corridor in the school, not for the classroom. I'm, I'm sure you had posters in your classrooms at school, did you? What were they like? Simple. Did they have lots of words on them? Most of it, actually, they tend to have pictures, but quite a lot of words. They're like little textbooks that you stick on the wall, usually, because the classroom is the teacher's place. So the poster is not actually targeted at the children, graphically at all. It's targeted at the teacher. It is, it is created, so they'll stick it on the wall. They go, oh, nice poster. This is in a corridor of a school with all those kids going... <laughs> It's a different shape from any other poster that would be there in that corridor, deliberately, so that people would go, God, bloody hell, what's that? So communicating using posters is, not, is, is actually interesting. The targeting is interesting, the audience targeting is interesting, but when you, as people, sit down to design a poster, you will design one that you like, and it will, and it will be fine for people of your age and gender. But it will not be fine for people who are not that age or gender. So that's why having professionals from outside an organisation create posters if they want to create them for audiences other than people like themselves is very important. So public spaces. Well, it's a good opportunity to meet people. Uh, you get face-to-face -face interaction. Uh, and, you can, and once you've got one, you can use it over and over again. Supermarkets. We do events in supermarkets. Oh, well, we did. And I've, I've, actually, I've just done one in Saudi Arabia. 15,000 people took part. Basically, it's a quiz. You know, supermarkets is about quizzes and prizes. Is it in, in Austria? You know, it's competitions where you, you, you do something and you get to run around the supermarket and collect bottles of gin. No? Oh, well, in Britain, it's about competitions. There are competitions you can scratch cards and you win things. And this was a quiz we created. Uh, it's, it's just, this is just a picture of a supermarket. But this is the flower stall. And above the flower stall, there was a question. Are flowers male, female, or male and female? And above the, the, where the tins of peas and soup and things were, tins preserve things because, and three options. Because tins kill bacteria. Because tin kills bacteria because there's a vacuum in there. And one other I can't remember. But basically, a multiple choice, very simple, 10 questions. You would fill in as you go around, hand in your thing at the checkout, and at the end of the week, the, what, the person who's got, got it all right and was drawn from the hat got £200. Um, called Checkout Science at Tesco's, it was. Um, here's me in a motorway service area. You know, big an autostrada, not, not an ordinary petrol station, but an autostrada service area uh, in Britain. And uh, I've got this egg. But actually, the crucial thing are these two people here, the kids. They're, you see they've got a bag here and, and here. This bag contains a science kit, a little set of science experiments, one of those squeezy ball things that light up when you squeeze it, and um, some uh, sort of paper cut-out aeroplane thing you can make, and... Nothing that went bang, because that could make your father crash. <laughs> but basically, we were handing out little science kits to kids, because the parents really liked that. Because, of course, kids get bored. And if anybody's got children, and take them in a car. I'll be there yet. All that. So, but you can't hand things to adults in a public space. They'll just go, 
They walk straight past you. You have to stop them first and then give them things. It's fine. They'll then take them from you. But if, if, you, if you stand in Klagenfurt Town Square and try and hand out even money, <laughs> people will ignore you <laughs> as a rule. Uh, even if you try to hand them five euro notes, they'll walk past you. They think there's some trick involved. So you have to get them close to you because physical proximity is ex extraordinarily important to trust. So, for example, as I move into the audience here, I'm changing in your mind. You're saying, oh, God, his beard really does go in his mouth. And, <laughs> and, and, I'm, and I become a different person. And if I come close to you, then suddenly, well, as long as I don't get too close, but, <laughs> but I'm, I'm transformed again and become the person in the bar and so on. So, actually, physical proximity is extremely important to human interaction, as actually is touch, but I can illustrate that, I hope, just in a second. Um, here we are. I promise I'm not going to really touch you. D hand that to me. Just hand, no, just hand me that, okay? And do it again. Thank you. Any difference? There was a difference. Second time you gave it to me, I touched your hand, just slightly. Now, there's a really interesting little experiment happened in Canada where they a library, you know, the person who takes the books back, usually is one, and uh, they replaced that, it was a woman, they replaced her with an actress. And they just said to her, now and again, without the person noticing, just <coughs> touch their hand as you take the book. And uh, they were interviewing the people who handed the books back outside the library. They videoed the interaction and then they were saying, and, and what did you think of the librarian? And the people said, oh, if they'd been touched, they were saying, yeah, I, I, interesting woman. You know, quite, I, I thought, you know, does a good job. I think. And if they hadn't been, she said, which woman? They didn't even know they'd been touched. And if you then, incredibly, if you then ask them about the library itself, say, well, you know, are the toilets clean? They say, yeah, yeah. If they've been touched, they'll say, yeah, they, yeah. Yeah, it's a well, well-organized library. Yeah, I find my books really easily. And if they hadn't been, they say, well, it's just a library, isn't it? It's all right, I suppose. Which is why, when you get on aeroplanes, everybody smiles at you. Because basically, the experience, the personal experience you have with the air hostess as she arrives, is transferred to the whole experience of flying. So if someone smiles at you as you get on an aeroplane, it's going to be a great flight. And if you're asked about it afterwards, I'm not kidding, if you're asked about it afterwards, you'll say, God, yes, that British, you know, British Airways are brilliant. Just because the air hostess smiled at you. And if they don't, <laughs> then, then, then you'll say, bloody British Airways, they're awful. You know? So, I mean, they're just the service was terrible and, you know, I didn't get my cup of tea when I wanted it and, you know, whatever. You know, it's really extraordinary. That personal experience we transfer to the whole organisation that we have it with. So, actually, a close-up like this is very important. The minute you have people with, close to you, the whole relationship changes. So I'm showing them something stupid to do with an egg, which actually is the fact that you can tell the difference between a boiled egg and a not boiled egg. Do you know how you can do that? You're spinning it, yeah, you spin it. And boiled eggs spin like they're made of wood. And unboiled eggs hardly spin at all. Run home and do it. Anyway, one way or another. So I'm doing that. Parents have come forward. Actually, the children will have come forward first. They'll be sort of here. And the parents are sort of here. And then if the, if the children continue to be engaged, they'll, they'll sort of... <sighs> <laughs> and then if the children are really interested, the parents will be roughly where they are there. Here. Yeah. So they edge forward. But the, trying to engage adults in a public space is extremely difficult. But with children, it's a lot easier because they will move in with their children over time. Not immediately, very, very shy. Adults are very shy in public spaces as a rule, but they will move forward over time. So I've got them there, and I have someone who's handing out bags, and it's fine. They'll let me give bags to the children. My assistant, who's out of shot here, um, was giving bags, and there's no problem. So that was just a way of taking some science to people on a motorway. This is a pub. The British do quizzes in pubs. No one else does, I don't think. Do they do, they do it in Austria? So general knowledge quizzes in pubs? Nah. Bars? No. Anyway, 
but the British do. The Irish pub does. <laughs> Don't surprise me. So, and so, well, it's a weird thing because it's entirely British, she, Irish, well, sort of. Anyway, but it's that we, we do it. I mean, every Thursday night, there's a quiz in the pub. And, uh, so, uh, <laughs> in many pubs, I mean, I'm not, this is a wild generalization, but it's true. Most pubs, on the quiet night in the middle of the week, they have a quiz. And people, and they, they, people are very serious about it, and they're sort of you know, comp competing. So here we have teams of people, and th this is a quiz about all the science around you in a bar. It's not random questions about science, like, but it's, it's about the science of beer, the science of whiskey, the science of toilets, the science of hangovers, the science of getting caught for drunk driving, the whole sort, you know, the science, the science of. And people are also doing little tabletop tricks. This is one which involves a lemon, matches, water, and an ashtray. And if you're really, I don't think I can do it actually, I haven't got all the ingredients. But basically it's very simple, you put the water in the ashtray, you take the lemon, slice it, stick three matches in the lemon, float it on the water, light the matches, turn another glass upside down on top of the lemon, matches burn, then they go out, because the oxygen runs out, and then the, all the water in the ashtray rushes into the glass. It's a brilliant trick. Stun your friends. But you can ask people then, why does that work? Why? Good question, you see, why, for people about science, because that's what you're all doing. Why? So, why? Why does that happen? And you award bottles of beer to people who get it right, or whatever. In Italy, which I've just done it, I've just done it in Italy, it's wonderful, because, of course, Italians aren't, don't behave at all like the British in a pub. They don't treat it like a sign of, you know, examination. They treat it like a social competition, so they're shouting at each other, no, no, it's not that, no, just don't be so stupid, no, it can't be that, no, and so across the room here, there, everybody's absolutely, it's chaos. You can't even ask the next question, it's so loud, so noisy. <laughs> but, but it's fun. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, different cultures, different things. But you can transfer. But you could transfer this. Of course, they don't have pubs in Italy, but they do, of course, have bars, and they do have social events. They they do a lot of kind of evening social events. So it's very easy to adapt this. And I had a grand time being shouted at by Italians. Uh, I'm going to stop there for the meantime, uh, and uh, get your questions, feedback, reactions. Whatever you have, um, and uh, I'll try and uh, handle them because I've, I've left half an hour. If you if you actually dry up, I've got other things I can say. But I'd like to give you a good chance to ch chat to me because you might never have met anyone like me. And uh, you know whatever whatever occurs to you, challenges, questions, queries, ideas, whatever. Yes, critique it, certainly. That will pass the time. Yeah, I'll, I'll have a quick look. Oops. Mind you. <laughs> in my, whose poster is it? <laughs> I'm sorry. No, that's not fair. I, well, it's an anonymous poster as far as I'm concerned. And I'm sure all of you would have created a similar thing. So I would not take this personally. <laughs> um, it was made for a conference. It was made for, for a scientific conference. Yes, yeah. But that's right. And as, as I said, and you must... You know, you've just, you mustn't be insulted by me. I mean, there is a way that scientists communicate with scientists. It works perfectly well. I'm not saying it doesn't work. I'm just saying it's a special way. And, and if you're going to communicate with other audiences, you have to somehow get that out of your head, that's all. But, it's, it's not, but I'm not rubbishing how scientists communicate with you. It's very effective. You know, everybody, there's an agreement. You know, that's how you do it, and it works. Why should I be bothered about that? But I, it's, it's, a, it's when you move on to another level and talking to other audiences yeah well this is this is colorful <laughs> and actually actually uh so it's not made by me no not made by you so I've, i don't know how i can display it particularly effectively um oh stick it on there yeah yeah i can critique it for you just just for fun um the other thing to say is that Actually, some of the principles that I've been talking about are important when scientists are talking to scientists. That clarity thing, 
is still important. Here we go. OK. So it's a inter very interesting subject, self-organising systems and evolution. Even I have the beginnings and understanding of that. OK. So, actually, there's lots of good things to say about this, not just because you're in the room, but because actually there are lots of nice This, this is much better than the average in my... I, I, sometimes when I talk to scientists, I'm actually doing it with the posters, all their posters around me, because I'm part of the session, and then I can have real fun going around. Anyway, so what's good about this? Well, lots is good. Um, the major issue about um, getting a message across with a poster is how people are going to read it. So there are lots of nice uh, diagrams here, neatly presented, which can give you a view um, and a snapshot of a particular piece of, of the message. Um, there are some parts of it um, which you'll notice, though, that sometimes it is not so clear. For example, this. this. This is role was in the poster. It's not as clear as, say, this. Because this is an explanation of something using a, a, a visual illustration. Whilst this, you have to very, very closely to make the connection. Actually, I, think I, I can see from the illustration that there is actually a close connection between this and this. There is actually a message about football here. But it's, it's strong here and lost here, because this is too generic a picture. And so someone will look at it and go, why are we suddenly looking at a computer screen? It will take them quite a while to work out they're looking at a, a football pitch represented on a screen, or it might. So, and the other thing is the whole business about the relationship between these different diagrams and the text. How do you know? I mean, you know, and you could point, tell people where to go, but how do you know where this relates to? Where does that arise within the text? And how is the story, think of it as a narrative, as a story, how is the story being told? Because the best forms of communication are a story. They begin with something, they have a narrative where you can follow it. So everything here needs to be linked in ways where the relationships between these things are obvious, and they're not obvious to me at a glance. But you would be there to point them out. And it's all written, and it's, it's created with that in mind. I'm sure you had that in mind when you created it. But bringing it to me now, with you not standing here, um, I'm going to have a difficulty in picking up the connections between the diagrammatic and the text. Um, also, if this was in a public space, of course, this is very, very dense text for people to read. But this isn't in a public space. It's designed for a particular audience. But in fact, there, there is a really, I, I would suspect, there's a very interesting story that could be made for the public. Because you've done one of the things which I was talking about. You've linked the, your work to football. So you've taken your work and said, well, what about what I do as an analogy or a metaphor could be successful for the audience. In fact, you decided that your own colleagues might need this metaphor. But the public would need it even more. So if you've got this kind of f footballing, goal-scoring metaphor going on, that would help the public access what you're doing. So you've taken... A, the thing I said was the most important thing, which is try to see your research from the eyes of a non-researcher you've begun to do. And you could create a version of this which was made your work accessible to the public. You'd have to reduce a lot of the bullet point kind of words, single points, you have to increase the relationship between the illustrations and the narrative. And you'd have to be sure that every single piece of illustration has a meaning. So for example, I still don't know whether that's cutting the grass or whether it's a part of the story. This could well be the key to the story. This could be the thing you made which has these characteristics. I mean, I'm only guessing. I don't know what it is. There's no way of knowing what it is by looking at the poster. So basically, it's about trying to tell a story in a way where everything, 
everything links to everything within the poster. And where it's obvious, remember I said, trying to work out where, how to read it. You know, we read, of course, you know, from, from left to right. Um, should I be reading this from left to right? Should I, I start here? Yeah? I start here, presumably. I start, well, I start with the title. Then I start here. Yeah, so that's on the right. Then I go here. <laughs> then I go there. Then I go here, here, here. No, I don't think I do, do I? I have a feeling the relationship between the, these different textual elements is not the classic reading frame. It's actually slightly more... The other part is the message. They're not... So the question, the simple question of, well, so where do I start and where do I finish? And what relates to what? There need to be more cues if you weren't standing there. But you will have been going, well, you see, and then, well, and this, the, the, and then we notice that, you know, and so on. You are making these connections for the person standing beside you. But if they encountered this on their own, they might have a problem, mightn't they, in terms of... And sometimes you actually do see posters where people have put in arrows, put in a, a you know, an arrow here, an arrow there, so, so that you've got a clue. This, read that then go to this, then go to that, read that, go to that, read that, go to this, whatever. But whatever is the logic of the story um, can, be made, can be clarified within the poster. So uh, assuming that this was uh, for a broad audience and uh, that you extracted all the important things and then at the end you would have the robot and the football. Mm. And uh, how would you live with the, with the situation that, let's say, a week later or... Oh, yeah, the guy with the football. Yeah. And I'm actually totally not feeling football at all. Yeah. So, I mean, how do you do translate? Well, basically, you have to be, when you're using metaphors, you have to make them clear. You have to make the link. So, if you're using football, it has to be crystal clear why football is relevant. Otherwise, you're quite right. People will just go away with a, with a sort of random impression. You're the guy who had the football on his poster. But you can get around that if at the point we introduce the football motif, you are explaining its relevance. Because actually, of course, it's a very powerful tool, metaphorically, allegorically. So, but you have to, to a broad audience, you'd have to say, it's like football. <laughs> it's like football. You, you know, you have to make it critical. It's like football because, or it can be compared to football because, or it's about football because this machine can play football. Or it's a, you know, in, and then you avoid that. Um, so if you, and the metaphors are very powerful, and people will remember them. As long as you introduce them right and clearly, it will really work well for you. Um, but here, the, the football metaphor is, is there, but it's not absolutely clear what it's, what it's in, for, to a non-expert, and I'm very much a non-expert, it's not clear what it's being used for at a glance. That's the other thing. The attention span of people, and I think even at scientific conferences, the attention span of people in front of posters is not very long. You're talking about, you know, you've got a room full of posters. Uh, sometimes they'll engage you if you're sort of standing, looking relaxed and smiling, and, you know, would you like to, you know, whatever. But otherwise, they'll probably look at it. Yeah, Ooh, very interesting. And so, so the time they have, it's, it's a few seconds. Maybe 10 seconds, we, we assess. We assess our ability to understand something very quickly. And if, and if we don't get it pretty quickly, then we'll tend to just move on. Because there's plenty of other things we can go and look at. So the important thing, so this is very, this is very important to automatize testing and the parameter optimization. Design. You see here, this kind of wording would be, ah, you know, how to make them better, <laughs> how to make Whatever it is, how how to, um, yeah, I would have to think. But basically, you'd have to rephrase that to make it clear what exactly is your aim. Um, and then, if that was there, then that would stop people long enough to then travel into the rest of the story. Uh, but uh, as it is, it would be a specialist audience who would travel. But then it was designed for a specialist audience. So it's not fair in the sense that 
Uh, but on the other hand, by looking at it, you can see what you would do if you were looking at a non-specialist audience. Everything has to be self-explanatory. Everything has to reinforce everything else so that you can follow the story really easily and it's linked to their everyday experience. Okay. Other things that have arisen in your heads while I've been talking. Yeah. So, uh, as a researcher, I would say, okay, I have to focus on my, s mm. my subject whatsoever, and uh, now I, I also face the issue of presenting, mm. and then I would have to say, okay, 20% of my time I should spend mm. on this, and then at some point I have to decide, would I like to do some, should I, can I focus on my research, or do I have to spend 50% of my time preparing slides? Mm. And uh, is there a... For, for, for a researcher in the scientific uh, mm -hmm. or in, in computer science area, you would say, uh, is there a generic way of uh, presenting those so that I can minimize the time that I have to do with this? Or is it or is actually, if I try to do it this way, that's the worst way you can do it? I don't know. Um, I, a number of answers to that. I mean, the first is that I tried to say as I began that actually there are reasons why improving your sort of your awareness of communication and its principles is important to you professionally and whether you gain that awareness by within your own professional sphere or whether you actually gain it in the slightly more challenging environment of communicating outside of your professional sphere is your choice but my sort of thesis to you was that it's likely that during your career you will work with people from quite different disciplines from yourself and it's likely that you will encounter some issues in relation to your ability to understand each other which will actually make, make it more difficult for you to do a good job as a team. So for me I would say that there isn't necessary that although of course you can't submit your whatever you do for the non-expert you know for peer review or whatever, it, it is a valid aspect of what you do at the core of what you do. It's not an add-on. It, it actually having good communication skills is immensely valuable to any individual. Um, and whether you're thinking about finding funds or working in interdisciplinary teams, whatever it is, it's hard to come across anything where having thinking about communication in the way that I've been talking to you today can't be of some value to you. But just having me come and talk to you about it is probably not enough. It doesn't embed it in a way which will mean you'll use it. You know, you might say, oh, well, it, was, it was interesting. Hairy old bloke, but it was interesting. But basically, if you do something, anything, it doesn't have to be very big, actually, because well, it's not scale-related. You know, I mean, it's not, you don't have to do something huge at all. It could be very small. But if it contains these principles and you thinking in this way, it will embed these basic principles of communication, which I think, I would argue strongly, are of value to you as an individual and as a professional. So rather than have the, well, I've got to do my scientific research and I've then got to make space for doing something else, I, I would be much happier with the model where you're saying, well, actually, as part of my work as a scientist, I have to be a good communicator. And, and therefore, I should give myself the chance to, to acquire some of these skills and practice them. That would be my view. Because uh, I think it's hard, uh, I mean, to be, to be frank with you, I mean, it, it's not at all uncommon for, for example, senior scientists <coughs> to be less open to the idea that it's worthwhile learning communication skills. Um, and there's a very interesting survey done. It's by the European Molecular Biology Organization. And... They have fellows, advanced fellows, all around Europe. And they sent their, their senior fellows a, a questionnaire, which asked them to rank order the skills which they thought that their postdocs and postgrads should have. And you know, it was all about you know, um, analytical skills, critical skills, you know, literature searching skills, and so on. And way down the bottom of the list was communication skills. But there was a second half to the questionnaire which asked them, Ask the senior scientists, well, as, a as senior scientists, as you are now, 
which skills do you wish you had? <laughs> and you know what you know what I'm going to say. Basically, then communication skills came very high in their lists. So it's a bit of a paradox. Senior scientists tend to see communication skills as being something that a bit of an extra for young scientists. On the other hand, they themselves often feel they lack them and would like to have them. <laughs> I don't know how you balance that. But I, I think that more and more, actually, there is a consciousness of the need to communicate because of this emphasis now on the societal impact. You know, in, in the old days, when I began my science, you just did research. And, you know, if somebody asks you, you know, how's it going, you go, fine. You know, well, have you, you know, is it going to be useful? Maybe. <laughs> uh, those, that, those days have gone. Uh, and now, the, the idea of there being a connection between what, people, what scientists do and, their, and an impact in the real world has got much, much larger. And I think for that reason, now when I meet senior scientists, they tend to be more, uh, they may begin with some scepticism, but they quickly realise that this could really help them um, in terms of the demands that are being made on them to explain what they do um, to policymakers, to um, funders, to the public. Long answer, I'm sorry, but you know, I, th I think that's probably the, the, the way to think of it. Yeah. A lot. And they are trying to advertise it uh, among children mm. or, or young adults and so. Mm. But still, the, the most idols in the country are these very, very stupid, very, very simple celebrities and so. Yeah. And I think this kind of trend in the world can be seen almost anywhere. Mm. And what I see is that even though I managed to raise some interest in, in, a, in a topic, mm. and even though I try to lower the complexity uh, very much, people are just too lazy to think. And this is, I feel like a borderline, where, where I want them to, uh, I don't want to give the ads at all, because I don't want to solve the problem. Yeah. I want them to think a little bit and then enjoy finding out the answer yeah. themselves. I, I think that there's, it, some of these things have to do with style. I mean, I've worked actually quite a lot, uh, for example, in Croatia, um, in, in Latvia, and in the Czech Republic, mainly. Um, and. Uh, the, uh, the scientific establishment in, in those countries is, is very, uh, tends to be quite uh, uh, conservative. Um, and uh, the idea of, of you know, communicating to children that hung Hungary once had great, you know, has had great scientists is actually, a, now you've heard me speak, it's a really difficult thing to do well. You can't, to children, I mean, what does it mean to them? I mean, these old guys, or maybe it's from old women, uh, you know, who once upon a time were part of their history, who were great scientists. So? So, you know, so, as an experience, I mean, what you're, what you're thinking about with these things is trying to create experiences for, say, children. That's true of, and of and some. Yeah, but actually, um, I, of course, that is a problem across. It's not a Hungarian yeah. problem, but but I don't think it's. I don't think though that it's the case that it's not. It, there isn't. There aren't ways in which you can create experiences for young people, which are engaging for them and which they are memorable for them. Um, the, the the science centre movement in. Europe. I don't know if Hungary has science centres, sort of interactive science for children, sort of informal learning of science. Yeah. They have. I, I mean, so th those kinds of experiences, uh, I would say that yes, of course, we're surrounded by a culture of celebrity, but it is also possible to use um, role models um, who, for example, in Britain, there's been a lot of focus on this woman, young woman engineer, who works as one of the principal engineers for the Ferrari racing team. 
You know, so, in a sense, you know, she's an engineer, but she's working in a very high-profile role, unexpectedly high-profile role within motor racing. Um, and so, sometimes it's possible to create the, these, these sorts of stories, these, these, these kinds of worlds. Um, my experience with young people is that al although there may be some of them who believe everybody becomes a celebrity, there are also a lot who are interested in the, you know, what, what are they going to do with their lives? You know, what, what's it in, in a career, in a, a job? You know, you know. And uh, I think a problem for science has been that actually the career progression in science has not been very obvious. You know, you know, you, so you, you do your post graduate work, you do your postdoctoral work, you, if, you know, if lightning strikes, you might end up with a university post. You know, I mean, it, it, it's not been very clear as to what it is you do. Um, but I, I do not, in encountering young people, necessarily always encounter people who say, well, I'm not going to bother with this, I want to be a pop star. I, I, I think they are a bit more realistic than that they know that only a small percent of them are ever going to become pop stars. And so, although there is definitely a huge issue around uh, science education, and actually most particularly in places like, you know, the, the ex-Soviet bloc, uh, where the teaching of science is highly traditional, often by rote, you know, not, you, you learn things, you know, it's not very experiential, uh, you know, it's actually, uh, that makes life even more difficult because the children's impression of science is of something that's boring and and sitting, you know, taking notes and you get it wrong. That's a big problem with the public. As far as they will look, if you say to them, you know, I'm a scientist, or don't ask me any questions, I'll get it all wrong. There's a whole culture of you're going to get it wrong, <laughs> uh, which is very difficult to, to work with. So I'm not saying there isn't a problem, there is, but I actually think that there are things that could be done which would be immensely useful. Reforming the educational process is, is one, a big one. Um, and that's not just a problem in, in, you know, in Hungary or Czechoslovakia. Or, I mean, it's just not, it's, it's around. I mean, it's, I work a lot in the Arab world, uh, in Saudi Arabia. Bloody hell, the science teaching is awful, terrible. Um, and once again, based, of course, on Islamic uh, teaching methods, which are about learning things by heart. Uh, so, it's a huge issue, but I, I'm not, I wouldn't be completely negative and say, well, yeah, all young people are. One of my experiences with Hungarian culture, it's just <coughs> to be smart. Mm. It's in the class, who is the, the smartest guy, mm. who has everything is, mm. it's like, oh, this is a weirdo, this is some nerd or something. <coughs> and then, of course, he doesn't want to be anybody, uh, just mm. to avoid it. And nobody wants to be the smart guy. Yeah. yeah, some cultures that may be more like that, than others. I, I think that Britain has a bit of that. It depends a lot on the school. Uh, but some people d you know, do want to be smart. But I, I think that some schools, it certainly would be a dangerous thing to be smart. Uh, but I think, to be truthful, I think that rather than the Nobel Prize winners being trotted out, it's young scientists who should be in there, in schools, talking to people about what they do, why they do it how exciting it is, you know. I think that young scientists are much more powerful advocates. And work that's been done around Europe would suggest that's true, that when children interact with young scientists, they can relate to that, and they can relate to the job that young scientists do. And if the young scientists are, are enthusiasts, that crosses over to them. So I wouldn't go the Nobel Prize winner route. They're just too dead, as a general rule. Regarding your uh, your comment or your analysis that people are young people are realistic, I think one problem is uh, when we look uh, how young people are influenced. Uh, there are these shows on television mm. where you can see uh, uh, young people trying to become pop stars. Mm. Like, I don't know. What oh yeah. You can idol in, in British. Is yes. Basketball. Yeah. yeah yeah no yeah um, um the X Factor, etc. Mm. What can we get most out of it? And obviously, and this, this relates back to what you 
this concept. People uh, just prefer watching young people trying to become pop stars yeah. more than young scientists trying to become Nobel Prize oh, right. shows. That's, that's generally true. I have a nice counter story, which is that we created, oh, it's happened here in Austria actually, something called Fame Lab, which was a competition for young scientists to explain an aspect of science. This could be their research, could be any old aspect of science. Uh, it happened here in Austria last year. Uh, and it happened in Turkey uh, last year. It happened in nine countries in this sort of general region of Europe. And uh, in Turkey, uh, 20 million people watched the final on television of Fame Lab. <laughs> You're from Turkey, <laughs> yeah. And then the winner of Fame Lab opened the the I think it was the the World Student Games, um, it, yeah, it, um, the university, World University Games. The, uh, the winner of Fame Lab did that. He became an instant celebrity. Um, so actually, and that was because he could explain. I can't remember what it was. I think I think it was. Uh, I know I mustn't make it up. But it would, he probably was explaining something like, you know, how camouflage works in moths. Or um, the one person who won Fame Lab that year was talking about uh, why spend three billion pounds on a hadron collider when you might discover nothing. You know, uh, you know it's worth, he, his message was money well spent. To find nothing would be fine. But we know there was nothing. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's, it's a very, in, so actually, using exactly those tools exact and, and, and in a sense just building on the cultural um, fame lab has been very successful it's now i tend to be interested in this kind of thing and i've never heard of fame lab yeah but it's uh, that's really i mean yeah that often yeah. happens yeah, yeah. Uh, often, i think i think yeah it's based in it i i, I yeah, i'm not a bit surprised i'm never unsurprised by the fact that nothing things don't travel i mean it's it, i think it, it was in it, it, there were regional heats uh, I don't know which regions of Austria, and the final was in Vienna. So I, I don't know how. It, it wasn't even in the television. I tried at least. There are a few science. Uh, no, no, because it, it didn't. I don't think it had a television sponsor. They never, they never make a special about it. Or no, in, in in Britain it's sponsored by Channel Four, and it they, it appears they they film it, mm -hmm. uh, and in Turkey they filmed it, um, and there are there were a few. It depends on the country. Some countries' TV networks pick it up, and some countries don't, and it just depends on their what they fancy. But, but, it's, but that sort of example of, us, of science, actually, I suppose it picks up on what you were saying, and you were, about actually, okay, we'll make some scientists into celebrities. <laughs> as scientists, not as pop stars, we'll make them celebrities as scientists, and that's what Fame Lab does. And it's worked, you know, it's now in Hong Kong, and it's in Egypt, <laughs> it's all over the place. Uh, because it's just a very simple format, and it basically makes celebrities out of scientists. Um, maybe not major celebrities, maybe not world tour celebrities, but there is an international final in Britain where every, all the winners from, of all the Fame Lab competitions from around the world come uh, in, June, in June and compete with each other. So there's a, a sort of global Fame Lab final. Anyway, but those sorts of ideas, <coughs> why not? Uh, you can't beat them. Oh, of course, and they always will. I mean, it's, I'm not, it's, uh, that's absolutely certain. Although there are some surprising things. For example, in Britain, science news, science-based news in newspapers is as much read as sports news. So actually, news about science tends to be <coughs> popular in the media, and people read it or listen to it. And so it, it isn't that, but there will be all, the, the science one is not going to be you know, the mass entertainment. But it doesn't mean it, it's not possible to find it a place in society where it, it's seen as having value and where scientists are seen as ordinary, hum, you know, normal human beings who do a, a job like anybody else and who do it because they want to improve the way the world works. You know, I mean, that's not so tough. And if that was just that m slightly more limited goal, it's worth, the, in my view, worth shooting for. Uh, another question, it's basically also related, uh, <coughs> that uh, I don't know how it's in Britain, but I, I thought it's similar, that uh, the uh, students uh, enrolling for physics, for example, or uh, engineering degrees, uh, the numbers are decreasing, mm. but for media studies, uh, exploding. Mm. 
Ja. Well, it's, yeah, it's very, it's, it's very interesting because something really weird is, going to, is just about to happen in Britain, which is that they're going to privatise the higher education system. So they're going to remove government funding completely from courses which are not science and technology. So you're, you will still pay to do science and technology degrees, as you do now through a student loan, but you won't pay anything like as much as to read humanities or social science. So, curiously, probably, and that probably... <laughs> ah! <laughs> Sorry about that, your, your posters hit the dirt side. Uh, I would suspect that that will actually, for the first time, switch that around, uh, because people will, will it'll, it'll bias the system towards people reading science and technology. And that may be something that happens in many parts of Europe, as the money gets tighter. But yeah, I've, we've had this battle for God knows how many years. You're absolutely right. The numbers have continued to fall. Although it's interesting, there are some places, uh, the University of Edinburgh, for example, I was born in Edinburgh, uh, has a chemistry degree. Chemistry degrees are just as bad as physics degrees in terms of attracting students. Uh, and back about uh, 10 years ago, they began to do uh, extensive sort of outreach work into the community around Edinburgh. Uh, they had a bus, I think it was a bus or a lorry or something, and they went out into the community, to schools and also to community uh, centres and so on. And that particular chemistry department has no problem with students uh, because it has made all these connections with local schools that, you know, now another generation of kids know, you know, that it's cool to do chemistry at Edinburgh. Uh, so there actually are things you can do locally which um, can change this. The overall pattern remains, remains dark, and I think actually it's the economics that will change it. It will be when, you get, when you're well paid to be a chemist, and when studying to be a chemist is cheaper than studying to be something else. Um, that would be my guess. Uh, I, but I think that there are examples where some inroads be made locally into that problem. As in to continue, I would say also it's uh, the university is really to try to balance itself. For example, if in the past the case there were uh, um, in the last century there were high development in the science, but in the past decades and years it wasn't so much improving. So it automatically balanced itself, and the people don't tend more to, toward bad sciences. Mm. Much more, maybe they find a way to be more successful, as you said yourself, to find more yeah. better salaries or fundings, and that mm. is the way that forced them to go to that. You, well, that's, that's right. Oh, the other aspect of this, which is interesting, is that many, of course, people who graduate, for example, in engineering in Britain, they don't end up as engineers. They end up working in the financial services industry because mm. they're good with numbers. <laughs> yeah, because they they just can handle numbers. Uh, so uh, another thing which is about you know, the way in which physics, chemistry degrees have been presented to young people is that they're only about doing physics and chemistry. And actually, in many ways, these are, it's about learning intellectual skills which can be applied across a vast range of areas of work. Um, the physicists and chemists have always been extremely resistant to presenting it that way. They want the students to want to be physicists to want to be chemists. But actually, uh, in the world of engineering, a significant percent, very significant percent of, of people who graduate as engineers go on to work in areas where you have to be good with numbers. We have to be a quick thinking with numbers, where you have to be uh, nu numerate, literate. And they have very good careers, believe me, in, in those areas. But they, those degrees you're talking about, they never, never quite been willing to, to say, you could do physics. But people who do our degree also end up doing this very wide range of things um, because they have unique skills. And it's the skills part of university degrees which are the most important. It's how people think. Specifically what they can do or know, you can change. You, know, you can convert yourself from one thing to another. But it's how you think. It's a training in thinking. And not enough emphasis is placed on that, in my mind. 
Oh. Well, <laughs> thank you very much for listening to me. I hope I've, uh, for those I won't see this afternoon, I, I hope I've given you some insights into an, another world, a world which I think there could be value for you exploring, um, both from your own point of view and from the point of view of your society and your subject. Farewell. Good luck with it. <laughs>